My name is Mo Amir and this is Van Color, British Columbia's bona fide culture and politics TV talk show right here on Check and Check Plus. We're also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Tonight, let's refocus on BC politics with a very special guest. This month, the BC NDP government had two major announcements concerning the concurrent public health emergencies, the COVID-19 pandemic and the drug poisoning crisis. For the pandemic, the mask mandate is lifted and the mandatory vaccine passport program will end on April 8th. For the drug poisoning crisis, now in its sixth year, the government will form an all-party committee to take the politics out of this public health emergency and build consensus for real solutions on this file. To talk about the implications of these announcements, we are joined by the MLA for Cowichan Valley and the leader of the BC Green Party. She is the philosopher queen of the BC legislature. She is Sonia first to know Sonia. So nice to see you. So nice to be here, Mo. So Kobe's over, right? The mask mandate is gone. The vaccine passport program ends on April 8th. British Columbians are celebrating, but you have some concerns. You know, I just checked into the hotel down in Vancouver, mm -hmm. and uh, the manager comes over to me and she says, oh my gosh, Sonia, I just saw this news about a new variant, BA2. Right. And she said, I, I'm so surprised to hear this. I didn't know that this was happening. But if you were monitoring what's happening in the UK in particular, South Korea, uh, China, mm -hmm. you would see that there has been this spike of a new variant or an Omicron variant, BA2. And as has happened with every other wave, what happens in the UK and Europe eventually comes to North America. Right. I want to look at it through a public health lens of how does public health work at its best? And that is education and tools. Mm -hmm. And so on two fronts with education, we have seen this government really not live up to what it needs to provide in terms of knowledge and understanding to the public. It's an airborne virus. Right. We just had the premier finally acknowledge this in an interview last week with Global. He said, finally, it's airborne. The minister of health wouldn't say it. Dr. Henry would sort of kind of work around not saying it. Mm -hmm. uh, but to understand how it's transmitted is to be informed on how to best not catch it, mm -hmm. right? And so masks are really important, but ventilation, filtration of air, these are really effective tools. And that's the second part of public health, it's tools. And so providing high quality masks to people, we should have had rapid tests going into the Omicron phase, we didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and ensuring that where it can, government is, in, is making sure that we have the cleanest air possible. This is an excellent approach to public health. It not only addresses the transmission of, of COVID, but it makes air cleaner everywhere, which is good for our brains. It's good for schools. It's good for uh, the fact that we deal with the health emergency of forest fire smoke every year now. Right. So it, it, it was like... What this government could have done, which was say, OK, how do we approach this in a thoroughly public health oriented way? Uh, they really didn't do. So you're disagreeing with Dr. Henry's approach right now. Yeah. I, and I think this is another thing is it, it was a global pandemic. Yeah. Uh, none of us have lived through a, a pandemic on this scale. Of course, the responses aren't going to be perfect. What's really important is to have that capacity to look at it and say, how do we do better? How do we ensure that those who are most at risk from something like a pandemic, and that's the people with the least resources, people in frontline working jobs, people mm -hmm. who don't have the, the financial security or capacity to avoid uh, infection as easily as others, how do we ensure that they aren't impacted the most? Right. So in terms of the public health response, when we talk about your concerns, the government just announced a public review of, of the COVID response. So wouldn't this be addressed in that? The review is pretty limited. Okay. Uh, it doesn't include the decisions that were made specifically uh, about COVID by the health officer. Uh, so what does it include then? Well, it, it it's, you know, were you satisfied? Did, does this, did this affect? Uh, work for you. I, I, it's a communications exercise for the most part, right? Got it's it. the government being able to say, oh, look, we went to the public. We asked them how we did. 
and turns out we did pretty good. Right, okay. <laughs> I want to shift gears to the other public health emergency, the drug poisoning mm-hmm. crisis. Last year, 2,200 people, more than 2,200 people in British Columbia died as a result of the illicit drug supply mm-hmm. in this province. For almost a year, you've been very adamant that you want an all-party committee where the BC Greens, the BC Liberals, and the BC NDP would sit together, build consensus, and work together on solutions in a collaborative way. Premier John Horgan just announced that he is going to move forward with this committee almost a year after you first suggested it. Why is this collaborative approach more effective rather than the traditional government opposition approach where you and the BC Liberals can basically act as uh, critics or hammer the government on maybe what they're not doing? Like, why is this collaborative approach better? At, at, at its core, what it allows for is to get a shared understanding of the reality of this health crisis and a shared understanding of, of what is creating this terrible toll of death um, to understand the the solutions that exist and are potentially uh, applicable in an urgent way, which mm-hmm. I think we need to be doing. It, to treat it as a, you know, government's going to do this and opposition is going to tell them that they're wrong is really to ignore the fact that this is a tragedy that is unfolding every single day in this province. Seven people are dying every day. And we need to recognize that some things are beyond being politicized. Right. The committee allows us to come together to agree that we have to find ways to prevent these deaths and to move with that shared understanding of reality to solutions as quickly as we can. Right. But the BC NDP are still a majority government. They still yeah. make up cabinet. So my yeah. fear is that this committee just gives them political cover. And what I mean by that is you might disagree with something that the committee agrees on and it, it moves forward in policy or in action or perhaps even inaction. And you stand up and you say, well, you know, this is the wrong way to do it. And the government goes, well, hey, Sonia, you were at the table. We were building consensus. So doesn't this take some of your teeth as an opposition party? The committee will will make recommendations. And typically what we find with committee processes is those tend to be unanimous recommendations. Mm-hmm. And that, again, comes from that shared reality. When you hear the same information from the same experts and everybody can hear the questions being asked and the answers to those questions, you build that consensus. The hope I have is that because all three parties are participating in this, that the that shared reality and that shared agenda moves beyond, you know, an election to election kind of approach and mm-hmm. says, this is a public health emergency and we are going to implement these recommendations that are reached through consensus and mm-hmm. through hearing the evidence and the, the advice of everything from experts to people with lived experience. Yeah. Well, I hope you're right, Sonia. Stick around because I do have more questions for you. Okay. Thanks so much. Folks, stick around because after some business, BC Green Party leader Sonia know will be here to explain to me what makes her party different as the other major parties in BC include climate action plans in their platforms. Plus, I ask her why Premier John Horgan is so popular. I'm Mo Amir. This is Van Culler. Welcome back to This is Van Color. My name is Mo Amir, and as promised, I'm back with our featured guest today, BC Green Party leader and the philosopher queen of the BC legislature, Sonia First to know, Sonia, thanks for sticking around. Hey, I have nowhere else to be, and this is great, Mo. <laughs> well, I'm happy to hear that. It's been great chatting with you. I have to ask you, though, Premier John Horgan is pretty popular, right? He polls well. It must be because he's done a great job on COVID and climate change and the drug poisoning crisis, because how else do you explain his popularity? You know, one thing I'll, I'll give credit to his team. I think they've done a good job of, of leveraging, you know, a, a likable character and ensuring that that's what the public sees. And, you know, kudos to them for, for doing a good job on that front. We've been through several years of crises now. Mm -hmm. And so stability is something that people are 
really craving. Right. And, you know, that's what was offered in the 2020 election was stick with us, the NDP, and, and we'll give you the stability that you want in these uncertain times. And I think that what the NDP has to be aware of is over time, uh, people are going to start to look at outcomes mm -hmm. and not just narratives. And when you have a government that says, we really care about climate change, but continues to give billions in subsidies to the oil and gas industry, particularly LNG Canada, which is based on massively increasing fracking in Northeast BC and methane em emissions, that's not climate leadership in mm -hmm. 2022. Uh, People are going to look at the drug poisoning crisis. And as we've seen, the number of people dying every day, every week, every month continues to go up. Mm -hmm. And unless we start to see some some real turnaround on that, people are going to say, well, maybe these guys aren't be able to deliver on their promises. Affordability is another one. This is right. a government that ran on affordability. And as we know right now with inflation rates, cost of housing, affordability is something that a lot of people are really concerned about. So yeah. they're coasting a lot on what was accomplished in the minority. And mm -hmm. a lot of that we made big contributions to getting big money out of uh, politics, uh, environmental reform. Clean BC was very much a BC Green driven policy agenda. Uh, the NDP is going to have to show that they have some of their own ideas. Right. So let's talk about this idea about identity and ideas. The BC NDP have really identified themselves or marketed themselves as working for regular British Columbians. The BC Liberals have marketed themselves as the party for free enterprise and that being the, the way to achieve success and growth for all British Columbians. The Greens have always across Canada, marketed themselves as having an environmental lens on all these issues because of climate change. However, we've seen in BC that all the major parties, the BC NDP and the BC Liberals, they include a climate change plan, which almost seems to take away a bit of your identity or your party's identity, I should say. And so my question for you is, what is the identity of the BC Greens? A couple of things. First, you know, I wouldn't say that the other two parties have good climate plans when they both <laughs> agree on subsidizing the oil and gas industry. I mean, that's that's not a climate plan right now. What your predecessor, but, Andrew Weaver, thought that the BC NDP had a great climate plan. Yeah, again, I, I'm going to let the public square that uh, kind of discrepancy of literally propping up an industry that is contributing to climate change and saying that you have a, a strong plan on climate doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. The BC Greens and, and my vision is really centered on health and well-being mm -hmm. and a recognition that our health is dependent on the health of our environment. Uh, but our health is also dependent on good policies that ensure that people have what they need to be able to thrive. And that's access to family doctors. That's ensuring that there are the conditions for thriving. Uh, early childhood education is something that we worked a lot on in the minority government. I'm really proud of uh, Katrina Chen and the work she's done on this. And, you know, for example, moving it into the Ministry of Education, that was a BC Green initiative. This should be seen as a pivotal part of education, early childhood. But that's another example of the BC NDP usurping your idea. So why vote Green or, or why identify with the BC Greens then? What's the difference? The vision that politicians and political parties should be putting forward is the vision for the future. And I talk about four pillars for the BC Greens as that vision for the future. That is health, healthy people, mm -hmm. healthy communities, thriving communities where people feel safe and have the capacity to be active participants in their community, have access to things like transit and parks and that kind of, you know, things that make life better. Yeah. Uh, trusted government and institutions, uh, and of course, a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. and, and recognizing that these things come together, right? That if you try to fulfill all four of those pillars, you start getting to a place where people feel safe, where people can be taking risks if they want to, because they know that there's that safety that exists for them. Right. But I think we really have to look at the future and, and, and say, 
what is the future we want to provide to the next generation and the generation after that? for which they don't have to forgive us. There might be some British Columbians, however, that say the history of British Columbia in terms of its economic history Mm -hmm. has been that of natural resource extraction. And what you're suggesting is kicking the ladder that was once uh, available to people for social mobility in, in many different communities. How do you square that with people who say, you know, these communities thrive on, on the extraction of natural resources and you're against that? Oh, I'm not against it. I'm, I'm, I'm. But if we are going to be extracting resources and natural resources, we have to make sure that the benefit of those resources are staying in communities. Mm. I, on my way here this morning, passed a, a logging truck on its way to Nanaimo uh, with logs that were no more than a foot in diameter. Mm-hmm. And when I got to the Helijet port, uh, I saw where those were being loaded, and it was onto a giant ship, raw logs. Right. Uh, how many jobs is that? That's a couple jobs of the feller bunchers, the big machines that take out these trees. It's a couple jobs of the the logging truck drivers. And then the rest of that benefit is shipped offshore. Right. You would remember in school, we learned about primary, secondary, and tertiary economies. Sure. We have this story of British Columbia, of the past being about, you know, we are a resource-based economy. Currently, those resource-based parts of our economy are less than 5% of GDP, fewer than 5% of jobs. That story doesn't make sense anymore, and particularly the way that we are continuing to export raw resources Hmm. and really provide profit-generating activities to companies, many of which aren't even based in British Columbia. Hmm. So how do we manage and ensure that resources that are public goods are actually contributing to the public good of our communities. And at the same time, recognize that our economy is 95% not based on resource extraction. Mm. We want to recognize the value and benefit of knowledge economy, the the role of education, high-tech innovation. Look at BC was a huge contributor to a lot of the innovation around COVID and around vaccines and and the response to this, the research that's going on, I want us to export the the capacity and technology and innovation to move this world into a post-fossil fuel economy. So you don't want us to be anchored by the past or the narrative of the past, basically. We can recognize the importance of that past in in where it's gotten us to in BC, Mm -hmm. but we have to be honest about where we are right now and then have that vision for the future. Really quick question. In two and a half years, do you still want to be the leader of the BC Green Party? Is that your vision (laughs) that you'll be running in the next election as the leader? Uh, yeah, that, that's that's definitely the plan. You know, I have to ask. <laughs> so so uh, yeah, I will be the, the only returning leader, perhaps, to the stage <laughs> Maybe. for the debates. <laughs> Sonia, you know I appreciate your advocacy and your voice in the B.C. legislature. Thank you so much for this. Thanks, Mo. Folks, that was the MLA for Couch and Valley and the leader of the B.C. Green Party. Now, don't go anywhere because we have something special for you right after the break that's going to shake up the B.C. political world. Well, actually, the super serious debate about the super serious things is up next. My name is Mo Amir. This is Van Collar. Welcome back to This Is Van Color. My name is Mo Amir, and we're gonna leave you tonight with another installment of Well Actually, the super serious debate about the super serious things. Usually I'm joined by Katie Merrifield, who always has something sassy to say at the start of these, but uh, she's not here. Well, actually, Mo, I can fill in if you'd like. Oh, uh, Sonia, these debates usually devolve into insult battles, and you kind of got this wholesome mom vibe. I don't know if it's a good fit. It's always good to be underestimated. What are you, some kind of coward? I mean, yes, but whatever. Bring it, hippie. Well, actually... Hot take, Mo. Mayonnaise is the devil's greasy emulsion of oil, egg yolk, and vinegar. Well, actually, mayonnaise is, mayonnaise is pretty good. It can, like, hold together a sandwich, I guess. You mean ruin a sandwich. It's gloopy texture. is the kind of stuff that is squeezed out of a popped zit. 
Its filmy aftertaste isn't just sad, but gag-inducing, like your self-referential use of puns, Mr. Momance. <laughs> when it comes to self-referential puns, you would be the first to know, Sonia. And while anyone can make any food sound gross, the binding power of mayo is much stronger than, say, the confidence and supply agreement your BC Green Caucus once had with the BC NDP government. Yeah, couldn't help but go there, hey, Mo. Shellac is a great binding agent, too, but we don't slap it on bread or mix it up with shredded cabbage. Well, shellac doesn't have omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, which are good for health. Plus, mayo makes so many yummy salads. Pasta, egg, tuna, chicken. Those are not real salads, Mo. I've heard some political spin in my day, but suggesting that mayo is healthy is making me dizzy. Mayo is like the lather of empty promises from a status quo government. It might sound good, but it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Mayo has withstood the test of time. Invented in France in 1756, mayo is the number one condiment in North America. It's a winner, Sonia. And we know North America is known for its great food. Thanks for the history lesson, but like many things from previous centuries, mayo has overstayed its welcome. We'll never truly experience great food if we go back to the same old condiments. We can do better, healthier, tastier, Greek yogurt, pesto, hummus, avocado, tahini. We can accomplish extraordinary things when we decide to come together and make it happen. But what do I do with all this mayo in my fridge? Well, Mo, like a lot of things in your fridge and your wardrobe, mayonnaise is well past its expiration date. So next time you're grocery shopping, choose something that will actually deliver on the promise of good food. Yeah, that wasn't political at all. Folks, that's our show. This is Van Color. We'll be back next week right here on Check and Check Plus, Sundays at 7 p.m. Find This is Van Color wherever you listen to your podcasts if you want to check out the full interviews. Thank you to the leader of the BC Green Party, the philosopher queen of the BC legislature, Sonia Firstenau, for tonight's show. This is Van Color. I'm Mo Amir.